The story for the film is actually several real stories, knife crime, postcode wars, sexual exploitation, grooming, drug abuse, mental health. It could have easily have been some sort of made up drama, but this is hardcore. There's no two ways about it. We're not glorifying this type of life. There's something that goes a lot deeper. It's giving all these children a voice, an opportunity to speak up. We're just trying to make the best film possible for all the young people out there to make sure that this film makes an impact. Yeah, I can do it. Yeah, because you got that shallow. The only thing I'm, I'm gonna have, he has to lean back to see the cover. Quite on set. Let's do this. Tan was Holmes commissioned this short film with Streets of Growth, Mazzy, and Isla about the harms and effects of antisocial behaviour, crime, and other issues that affect young people. We've been working with Streets of Growth for a number of years now, who work with young people involved and engaged in crime and antisocial behaviour to help them change their life trajectories into something more positive and productive. We've been working in partnership with Tara and its homes and working on free council estates where we've reduced antisocial behaviour by 45%. A few years ago there was an incident where there was a young person that was uh, stabbed and unfortunately they passed away. There was a video that was circulating across social media feeling very angry, very frustrated. I really wanted to do something, give young people through Isla and Mazi an opportunity to experience filmmaking and the filming industry. We got to do workshops with the young people for this film. So not only did we make a film for young people, we got the young people involved in the creative arts that they may not have had the opportunity or the facilities to do so in school or college. They were able to get, you know, personal hands-on experience with us. Yeah, we were able to pass on our knowledge to young kids who are really interested and enthusiastic and you know have them on set every day as well you know and create an opportunity yeah they came to the workshop they were holding the cameras they led this project it was all about them like every time we do something i'd look over and be like what do you think good yeah cool like I, they, they were my boss acting shots camera angles so what i really want you to do is soak it in and if there's anything you guys analyze about it let's hear your thoughts after we screen it is that all good so the story for the film is actually a real story, actually several real stories. So working with Streets of Growth and the young members of Streets of Growth, they sent in their own personal stories and their situations and issues they've been through. So many topics, knife crime, postcode wars, sexual exploitation, grooming, drug abuse, mental health. We had to change parts of it for safeguarding. But what was crazy about it was once I got the story done and finished, presented it to Koyas from Streets of Growth, and once he read it, he was like, even though you've changed aspects of it, all of this still happens. It was all real. You know, real young people went through this stuff. And then when it came down to the screenplay, writing, um, writing it word for word and the dialogue, like, I was young a long time ago. Not to say that, you know, I'm hella old, but slang has changed over the years. Let's just say that, you know, people ain't using dial-up internet. So I went to my mate Case's house. Um, you know, I've known him for over a decade. His slang's better than mine. He keeps up with it somehow. Uh, so I brought some of the scenes with him. He had written, I think, the, the skeleton of the, of, the, of the movie. And it was just the final stuff that we were tweaking, bouncing ideas off of one another. Although we have our own ideas, we won't make a bias to our own ideas. So we'll try to look at it objectively. And I think that helps to create what would hopefully be a real movie experience. You don't get that much in films nowadays because everyone's trying to like, you know, fictionalise things. This is doing something more than just Oh, hey, here's a film about knife crime. There's something that goes a lot deeper. It's really trying to shed light on the effects on young people. The fact that we're not glorifying this type of life or the storyline, and I'm sure the people that's been through this stuff, they don't want it to be glorified, just to honor them and their stories and you know how so many other people go through these type of things. When you think about that it's about real people and it's about their real stories, it's pressure, it's a lot of pressure because we want to get it right. But also I feel kind of like honored, like I feel really grateful that I'm, I've been chosen to tell their story, so we really want to do it. It could have easily have been some sort of made up drama, but you know, this is, this is hardcore. There's no two ways about it. This film focuses and centers around the characters of two young people, Abs and Yasmin, and how they've been caught up in a life of criminality, being groomed by two older gang members called Ghost and KD, and the unfortunate events that happen and really show the impact of how it negatively affects them and the people around them. Traditionally, 
actors and the crew would get the whole screenplay before you even walk in the room and I actually finished it two hours before we had the table read then I thought you know what let's actually experience this together I think my favorite part was ringing all of you individually and telling you got the role because each of you had like the most craziest response let's lighten up the room man tell us your name give me your fun fact I live just here one minute down there don't let him send you an invoice for travel yeah <laughs> So you're judging everyone right now. In it. Yeah. yeah. I've got a history degree. History degree. So we can ask you like what happened in 1924 and you'd know. Where? <laughs> <laughs> Anywhere. Like. Is it? Yeah. There was that silence in the room after we finished it. And usually it's not like that. You get like an applause. Oh, yeah, it's a great screenplay. But it was that intense that even on paper, it was like, whoa. The casting got so popular through social media and Star Now that Spotlight themselves contacted me. I thank them for the fact that it got out that far. People that were applying for this role were actors that couldn't afford a Spotlight, don't have a Spotlight account. Their talent hasn't been discovered, but I want to give new people opportunities. As someone who grew up with no one on TV that looked like me, I'm like, I need to make that change and make that happen for everyone else. Because someone else that's from that background, from that minority, will see that one character and feel like, that could be me. This is by far the most diverse casting crew that I've ever worked with. It was really fun trying to guess where everyone's from as well. <laughs> it reflects what London's like. You know, you, you see some of these films and they're all just white people and it's like, well, that's not what London is like. I got to learn about everyone's cultures and I was really honoured that they felt able to share that with me. You were telling me about your Algerian culture, I was telling you about Irish culture. Hearing the language that, that I speak at home, being kind of thrown around, that just made it so much more comfortable. Like, I don't think I'll ever feel that in another set. When I was little, you wouldn't see a girl with a hijab on the TV, you wouldn't see a girl with her natural hair. John, he's Colombian. Anna, she's mixed race with Nigerian. Aziz, she's Turkish. Even Shifa, for example, she wears hijab. A lot of actors in my industry, they put the hijab on and take it off because it's just a role to them. For Shifa, she lives and breathes it. You know, hijab is her life, hijab is her identity. That's someone I want to represent because we're in Thai Hamlets and the majority of people here are Muslim, they are Bangladeshi, they are, you know, hijab wearing sisters. So for me, she's an icon because young girls can look at that character and be like, oh, I could have done that, that could be me. I don't personally like to bring on board people that don't feel like it's the family. Any production I've ever done, whether it's budget or no budget, everyone that's been in the room has like a positive vibe about them. And that's also why all of you are in this room today. That's the one thing you've all got in common. The message of the film is, is so heavy that you need a crew that understands that and is, able, is there to support you at any given moment. I feel like everyone's just like a big family, supporting each other, helping each other at all times. Even people coming on set that it wasn't their day to be on set, but they were just like, I just want to support, I just want to be present. I've never met a, a crew so supportive that wasn't fake. You know what I mean? Like, you know, in this industry, people are like, oh yeah, you're so nice. And then they're talking about you behind your back. Happy birthday to Rosanna. Happy birthday to you. Gang, gang, come on. Blah, 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 blah. When I'm on like different sets, some people's mood and they're down all yeah, like, and like we'll be putting my mood down, but everyone was very like optimistic and people were like they were everyone was excited for the project. Didn't get any kind of a uh, vibe of, you know, anything negative or and they work so well with each other. If there was ever a moment where, you know, we we're doing a late night shoot and maybe the energy drops a bit or people are tired, we'd always try to remember why we were there. Tony, Olive, when I was hungry they got me Sandwiches, <laughs> rap. You got sandwiches? Yeah, I got everything. What? Yeah, I got everything. Yeah, nothing, I man. was proper looked after by screen. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I was fasting, bruv. Yeah. It was Ramadan on set for me, bro. We all got along so well. We'd go from like crying with laughter to like crying because the scene's so together. The fact that we were able to pray together on set. No, that was not. I've done that before. Allahu Akbar. It was the first time I saw like the prayer times on the call sheet. I loved that and small detail can make such a big difference in someone's life. So Isla and I were having a call and we sort of came up and said, why don't we put prayer times on the call sheet? That's never happened before. The majority of our cast and crew are Muslims. So it makes so much sense. And we wanted them to feel natural and comfortable on set because I understand if you came onto a set that's majority white people and you're Muslim, you might feel awkward about saying, oh, I need to hop out now to prayer or, you know, you feel uncomfortable, feel like you have to explain yourself. And we didn't want 
our actors and crew to feel like that. I personally didn't have to feel like I needed to make some like big announcement. I didn't feel guilty for kind of taking time out to pray. So the fact that it was already on the call shoot, every, everyone just kind of knew about it and respected it. We thought the call times were like that specific minute that you had to pray. So <laughs> we literally panicked, our heart sank because we missed it by a few minutes. And we were like, it's not, we're so sorry. This project was actually a blessing, alhamdulillah. Yeah. A blessing. I feel like this project got us closer to, yeah. to Allah, yeah. got us closer to our, each other as brothers. You're going to be acting out a lot of tough themes. If at any point you just need a, a little breather, tell us, like, don't, don't be afraid to, um, you know, talk to any of us, like, even anyone at Streets of Growth who talked to any of us, if there's something relatable to it in your personal life, we're doing a tough scene right now, I just need a moment, just to kind of centre yourself again, feel free and just tell us. I want this to be a safe space, I want us to have fun at the same time. Isla is someone I've seen in terms of some of the work he's done with Ownership Network, talented British Bangladeshi filmmaker, uh, actor. He was like the big bro. Yeah, truffle and throughout the whole set. He was just like almost like a father, figure almost, but also like a big brother at the same time. Oh, he's a dickhead. <laughs> no one <gonna> lie. <laughs> he knew what to say to make sure that we brought out the character. He fully trusts each and every person with the characters. Even when I wasn't sure, I'd ask him to give me, literally always gave me the best advice to make sure that I got it right. How was it first day? I love this energy. Yeah? so calm. It's like, I just, it's just happy on set, man. I love it. Man. Freeze you up to be like, all right, cool. I'm, I'm going to bring this idea and that, and I'm going to explore the scene. But there was a really emotional scene, right? So he left me to play with it the way I would. He didn't impose any of his, he just told me a, a basic guideline that this is what it is. And then he gave me the freedom to explore it on my own, which was really lovely. And I really appreciate that. There was always a level of respect and seriousness, as well as his natural warmth that he brought. All I want to see is you keep growing. Even beyond this film, I want all four of you to start rocketing even further because today was very impressive. Even to contact him, like, yeah. you can easily contact him. He goes long long. Yeah. There. So with other directors, send them an email. Yeah. All of them along. Yeah, that's what was well, man. Yeah, yeah. 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 Send them emails. The hell is that? <laughs> He's always open to listen to suggestions. Whether they were right or wrong, He'd always listen, and if he wasn't going to use it, he'd tell you why. I mean, the name of Johnny, he tried to, you know, because I'm not enduring, he tried to, like, he just made it very, like, culture really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, he thought about everyone. Some little bits, Isla was even directing me in Bengali, which is such a, not a weird thing, because a lot of things you can say in Bengali, which you can't really say in English, and you just understand it better. It's such a beautiful language. Um, there's a certain lilt to how the words are spoken, and he guided me in the right direction. The support that I got from Islam was absolutely amazing. He was so patient. <laughs> Always busting jokes as well. So that was nice just to at times take you away from the reality of what you're really filming. I just remember him like teaching me how to beatbox in the middle of our, in the middle of our set. Boots and cats and born to be clever. Boots and cats and born to be clever. Now don't say the word, oh. now, now beatbox it. <laughs> He had a serious side to him and it also had a like playful side to him. There's a time to be serious and get, get work done. There's a time to also be playful and just laugh and just have fun. And I think it's always just a perfect combination of the two. I think he's someone that's really emotionally aware. He's yeah, really attentive. He'd go around, you see him speaking to everyone, you know, having little one-on-ones. I'm enjoying having your own, man. Uh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm glad you like that shot as well. He said to me when we were doing the classroom scene, if you need to leave, go for it. He was very, very caring in that regard. And then when we were doing the outside scene, he was also very playful. He pandered to what we needed at the time. And that's what you need in a director, someone that knows the energy, can match the energy, can change the energy if, he, if they need to. And he's so good at doing that. Oh, is it me? Is it me? No, you're out. What? No, 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 I'm not out. I'm not out. I've been practicing all night to cry on cue. It got to the day and I was trying to get in the zone and I couldn't cry. I wanted it to look this way and it didn't. And then I, I ended up like having, I ended up having a strop because because I couldn't cry. He was giving me like this pep talk. I believed in you, right? Everyone else believed in you, and you proved everyone right. This is your first film, and you're a lead actress, yeah? You smashed it. I'm proud of you. We're good. <laughs> and I started crying because I was having a strop. So then they suddenly like put the cameras on. <laughs> there came a time where. 
last minute, I didn't want to do the project anymore. I think a lot of actors can go through this where you're very self-critical and you kind of feel like you can't get the job done. I don't know what was going through his head, but he kind of called me and talked me through it and told me how like all actors go through this. He's an actor as well, as well as a director and writer. So yeah, I learned a lot from just the words he was telling me. And he even told me like, once this project's done, you're going to feel so much better. And I'm just so happy he said that to me because after, after we wrapped, I was just so happy that I didn't quit. The worst thing you can do as a director is just make someone feel like a prop. Like they're just here to fulfill a duty and go home. Like they're here to fulfill a purpose. And there's a bigger purpose outside of me. Like I'm just one person in this whole project, but it takes a whole village. Do you know what I mean? And each person plays their role. And if you take that one person out, that whole thing is going to collapse. So if you're not the one to make sure all these pieces are fitting in together and everyone's comfortable and they're happy doing it, then you're not doing it right. 10 years since the Corner Shop show started and now we're filming a scene in a corner shop and just as a little nod to all the Corner Shop fans out there we've got my man Jeff, he's wearing the official Corner Shop polo Bro, this is crazy man, it's nice that I'm paying homage to where I started Get her focus and then boom on him as well Nice shot, that's a really nice in it In similar measures, Mazzy um, seen his work in terms of behind the camera I've seen Mazzy work, like little clips of him but this is different. This is me getting to see a different side of Mazzy. I think Mazzy's done an amazing job. I like the way that he played with the angles and the lights and stuff. So I am really enjoying it. And I really want to see the full version. Really eager to see it. He knows the angles. He knows exactly. He knows how to, you know, maneuver. He's controlling it. He knows controlling the whole, you know, you can tell. Only way to wait for him. Do you know what I mean? So much imagination, Lama Mubarak, like it's astonishing. Even though I, I, see, I see like Mazzy came in every time, you know, I know what I want, I'm gonna get this shot, that shot. There's things that happen on the day where you're like, well, you can't get that shot. So how do you improvise and still keep the momentum of the film going? I feel like he was really quick to just adapt to thing, get it done attitude. Sometimes I'm too aware of what's going on. I'm, I'm looking around, I'm trying to help out and stuff. And when you just look over and you know, yeah, do you know what, they got it, it's nice. I can just focus on what I need to focus on. All you've got to worry about is your acting. You know, if they say it's good on camera, then you can kind of trust them. I was like, oh yeah, we can just cruise through it because you, you know what you're doing, we know what we're doing, we're all in good hands. Getting to see like little snippets of playback, like when you're doubting yourself, and you're like, oh, that wasn't good. And then he shows you and he's like, no, no, it was good. I don't really like to look at playback or myself acting, but seeing everyone's reactions to camera work. These two will be able to relate to a lot of the issues young people face and vice versa that the young people who are going to be involved in the film could also relate to Mazzy and Isla. Our friendship dates back what over a decade ago we never had done have our way together. Where everything was described they had a vision and they knew how they wanted everything. First shot is obviously them meeting we get like yeah. a nice wide got yeah. the gate in the back yeah, yeah. over the shoulder but low angle. Yep. We were both on the same page. Yes. Like every time we do a scene he'd know what I'm picturing and he'd capture it just like I've pictured it if anything better. Come out of frame and action. If I was to get a close up, I would get a close up from here to here. It's a great um, DOP and director relationship going on. So you, you can sort of just relax and really just get into your character. And then no matter what decision he's making, he'd always come to me and say, but bro, it's your call. And that level of respect is, is unmatched. Do you know what I'm saying? And I, I'm just giving him the same respect back. I'm like, bro, this is, this is you, take care of it. How are you going to do it? Yeah, I'm thinking about the foreground more than anything. Ah, cool. I mean, I'm Did down. You're cool, though, Kaji. You're cool. Two of my closest friends within this industry working together. I can't not turn up for that. We're just trying to make the best film possible for all the young people out there to make sure that this film makes an impact. And I think that that pressure and that intention is riding on all of us. I think because it's real and because it's based on real people, real events, is why this doesn't even sometimes feel like a film. It hits somewhere else, do you know what I mean? As opposed to doing a drama and something uh, that's fiction. Two days after the the wrap of filming the last scene, one of my street team got this knife off the street of a young person who's scared. This is the fear that young people are living in. People who don't even want to use knives feel they've got to carry them to stay alive. I think it was about year eight or something like that. I saw someone literally get stabbed right before my eyes. They shot up a chicken shop and a young girl, at the time maybe in year eight, year nine, caught a bullet in the neck. She's not there with the boys that, that were targeted. Intensive care for a few days and then she passed away. You know, and, that, and that's, that's real. Uh, we, we, we filmed maybe a minute from where that happened. 
there were three occasions where I could have lost my life. I was outside my block. I could see my mum in the kitchen, top floor with a light on cooking. And there were two guys on the moped with their helmets on, pulled out a knife, it's about that big, and they got caught. I got called to the police station the next day and the police officer said to me, the driver had a fire on me, would have shot you. So to think that I could have lost my life with a bullet to my back, I could have died on my own street and that would have been an end of it. My dad and my brother, um, who were caught up in the drug world, and they'd be doing like drugs in the house and couldn't stand the smell, I'd put towels under my door. I would go to school and people would be like, do you smoke? Like, you smell of, of like drugs or smoke and things, and I'd be so embarrassed. It hits close to home for me. I um, suffer with a self-harm addiction. I'm in recovery at the moment, but I am a self-harmer. Um, been suffering with that since before I was a teenager. Um, suicide has been something in my life. My, I've had friends that have expressed suicide ideation um, and grooming is something that has hit close to home with me as well, whether that be myself and my friends. It's very implicit and it's very subtle. And from watching it as a young person, they might not realise that Abs has been groomed, that Yasmin has been groomed. But it's when we explore those themes that they realise, actually, people that groom have preyed on a vulnerable person. And if you are a vulnerable person, you might not realise. I have attempted to end my life multiple times. Um, three times I've ended up in hospital. One of them being when I was 15. What if I had been successful? in killing myself, I wouldn't be able to tell this story of this young girl and I wouldn't be able to maybe change the outcome of other young girls' stories. So to say no, five years on, I'm at 20 and I'm able to do that is just insane. Yeah. That kid that died in, in North London where he was selling clothing some boys come running into his house and then they killed him in, in, his own, in his own room. Like two minutes prior to that, he's thinking, I'm going to sell this jacket, make a little bit of profit. Two minutes later, he's dead. Like, that's how real it is. You don't have to want this lifestyle to fall into it. Uh, I fell into that life and um, I ended up going away for a year. And I remember speaking like to the judge saying like, you're going to put me in there with those people. You can see. I'm not that type of person, I've just been caught up. As you say, the system, they don't really care in it. They just, you're just another number to anyone. This is real. And the actors you see in this documentary and play it out, this is it. This is our world, this is our reality. And we're not gonna sit back and just let it happen. Someone has to take care of the next generation. Streets of Griffith really cared about the message. Like it's something that's really close to them. Like they're living proof of what happens here. They have like an art therapy section that's sort of by the waiting area. It's made by young people and it depicts what goes on in their minds and in their heads. And one of them said, you know, domestic abuse and how they felt about that, watching their mum getting beaten. It's clear that they have stories that they want to tell and that they need to tell. So absolutely, they, they deserve to make more projects like this. It would be a shame not to give them another crack at another film or a theatre project or anything like that because the work that they're doing is truly life changing. It's not just because they're a great organisation, it's because the team behind it know what they're doing and they genuinely care. And that's what, it, that's what it's about, that's what it takes. I want them to have more opportunities whether I'm a part of it or not. It's important to me because it's giving all these children a voice, an opportunity to speak up. It's going to resonate with people like everywhere. It's really going to touch people's hearts. I feel like anybody that watches it will really will take something from it. A lot of the scenes in the short film, it's very quick and fast paced because that's exactly how it is in real life. It's got a hard hitting message about the choices that you make as an individual, but also in terms of parents and guardians in helping young people. A lot of movies feel like, oh, you can go and do this and then you're just, you know, you're just walking free the next day. It doesn't work like that. You know what I mean? There's, there's consequences to your actions. So you go back to the title of the movie, if only, it's about sinking through the consequences so that we then make the right decisions early on. There are consequences that you're going to have to live with, your family, the people who you've affected, their family, the community. We're trying to say to young people and communities, we understand, we're not, we're not denying this isn't going on in the communities this harm, but it's important that you see you're not alone and that we're trying to make a stand and if you want help, you can get help. 
and we are there to support you so that you can live the life that you want to live away from harm. We want to take this film all around the UK because this is not just a Tower Hamlets problem. We know there's 32 boroughs in London, so we want to go across, to, we want to go up, I mean, wherever. We want as many eyes to see this. After seeing how it's all played out, not only will it change lives, I believe this will save lives. Whatever young people are feeling, it's okay to feel those things. Because, you know, as, as young people, we sort of, um, we, we feel shame. I, I remember feeling 15, 16 years old, ashamed of how I was feeling and ashamed of what I was doing. And I felt like I couldn't talk to anyone because of that. And I want them to know, obviously I won't speak on behalf of everyone that's involved in this project, but I'm living proof that it does get better. That if you just reach out and take that first step, if that is talking to someone that you trust or throwing the things away that, that, that you used to harm yourself with, it's just, we're here, we understand you, we, we, we're there for you. Hopefully you can feel comforted and that it will be okay. Bless you.